As if rubbing your pregnant belly and hearing birth stories of horror aren't bad enough, irritating and judgmental breastfeeding comments can really derail a mama on any given day. How can a breastfeeding mom cope with these judgmental comments without her self-esteem being squashed? Today, I'm thrilled to welcome back to our show, Amber McCann, an international board certified lactation consultant with the Breastfeeding Center of Pittsburgh. Today, we are discussing breastfeeding and dealing with judgmental people. This is The Boob Group, episode 91. Breast milk, it does a baby good. Silly daddy, boobs are for babies. I make milk, what's your superpower? If my breastfeeding offends you, put a blanket over your head. Dairy diva, don't be lactose intolerant. Nursing nature's own breast enhancement. Meals on heels. Whoever said there's no use crying over spilled milk, never had to pump. Breast milk, all udders are inferior. Whatever your point of view, we're here to support your breastfeeding goals. We're the boob group, because mothers know breast. Welcome to The Boob Group, broadcasting from the Birth Education Center of San Diego. The Boob Group is your weekly online, on-the-go support group for all things related to breastfeeding. I'm your host, Robin Kaplan. I'm also an international board-certified lactation consultant and owner of the San Diego Breastfeeding Center. Did you know that you can find over 80 free episodes of The Boob Group on our website? Our topics range from treating sore nipples to tricks when breastfeeding in public to breastfeeding newborns, infants, and toddlers. You can also find wonderfully written blog articles by our team of mommy bloggers. Don't miss out on all of these breastfeeding resources and make sure to check out our website today. Today we are joined by three lovely panelists in the studio. Ladies, will you please introduce yourselves? My name is Rachel Rainbolt. I am 31 years old, and I'm the author of the Sage Parenting Book, and I have three wonderful little boys who are now eight, five, and two. I'm Colina, and I work actually in a call center. I have one son. He is eight months, and he's here with us today, (laughs) and really enjoying the view. (laughs) I'm Chris Delermo. I'm 42. I'm a life coach, and... um, soon to be licensed professional clinical counselor. I have one son, age seven, and that's all. Perfect, <laughs> all right. And just quickly want to introduce MJ, our fantastic producer, and she's gonna tell everyone a little bit about our virtual panelist program. Yes, so many of you already know of and contribute to our VP program, so thank you very much. You're really helping support other mamas out there. Um, those of you who don't know, our VP program is a great way to join our online conversation when we record. If you're not local or you just can't be in the studio with us, but you still want to share your story or your opinion on our topics, you can. We record uh, When we record, we post on our social medias the same questions we ask our in-studio panelists, and we may even read your comment while we tape. So check out our website, theboobgroup.com, under the community tab to find more info on being a VP and possible perks for participation. Awesome. Thanks, MJ. Mm. Hi, Boob Group. This is Sunny with New Mommy Media, producers of the Boob Group. And before we dive into today's topic about dealing with judgmental people, I'd like to introduce you to Amanda Chagoya. She is the marketing manager at Bebe Ole, which you've probably heard of before. In fact, you may use some of their products on a regular basis. So Amanda, welcome to the Boob Group. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Amanda, I know you're a mom, and I know, in fact, you use these products on a regular basis. So tell us a little bit about Bebe Ole and the company's commitment to breastfeeding moms. Sure. Um, I mean, for us, it it all started with a breastfeeding mom. Like so many products, the idea for the nursing cover was actually born out of necessity. Um, Our founder, Claire, she actually designed the first nursing cover for her own use. You know, she was kind of shy about nursing in public, but she didn't want to leave the room to go and nurse privately every time the baby was hungry. And she was surprised to find that there were lots of moms that felt the same way. She got so many compliments from other moms about the cover that she was using. Her husband actually persuaded her to start a business around it. And, you know, here we are years later. You know, we constantly hear from our customers that their original plan is to find someplace private to nurse every time, you know, duck back to the car or duck into a restroom or changing room, or even, you know, they plan their day around getting home in time to feed the baby. And over time, I think most moms find that that's not really practical. And it it takes a lot of the fun out of going out with the baby because you're stressing like, oh, I need to get home in time for the baby to eat. So 
we're really excited about offering moms an option. There are plenty of moms who feel perfectly comfortable breastfeeding in public, and that is awesome. But there are moms like me and like Claire that you know have some anxiety about it, and we really are flattered and honored that we were able to put out an option for moms to get out and go and see the world comfortably with their babies. The company is known for the Hooter Hider. So tell us a little bit more about that product and what makes it so different. Yeah, so um, originally when they founded the company, the company was called Hooter Hiders, in addition to it being the, the product name. And it, of course, in the beginning, it was meant totally tongue in cheek. You know, the, the name got a lot of laughs. It was memorable. <laughs> um, over time, we renamed the company Baby LA, and but we held on to the Hooter Hider name for one of our lines of nursing covers. So Baby LA and Hooter Hider nursing covers really are different than other nursing covers that are out there, primarily because of the rigid necklines. We actually have patented neckline technology that we call Rigiflex that holds the cover away from mom and baby, and it also maintains its shape wash after wash. So mom's always able to look down and make sure baby is properly latched, you know, and continue interacting with baby because eye, eye contact is so important while nursing. So even while they're nursing on the go and they're, you know, having a private moment between the two of them, they can make maintain eye contact and that's that really is important. Another really cool feature of the Baby LA nursing cover is that it has internal terry cloth pockets. And I personally have found that to be super helpful. You know, you want to wipe up baby after they spit up a little bit. And then also they're great for storing breast pads and pacifiers. What we're really known for is our patterns. People love our patterns. Between Baby LA and Hooter Headers, there's actually over 25 patterns to choose from. So there really is something for every mom. There's even solid colors for the moms who kind of perform more simple classic look. Yeah, no, I, I really do like the designs. I think they're very sophisticated than a lot of the other stuff that I've seen out there on the market. Well, thank you. I will tell our design team. <laughs> now, I know you guys just launched a brand new line of muslin nursing covers. So tell us a little bit more about them. We're super excited about the muslin nursing covers that are launching this February. We sell our products globally. So we hear from lots of moms all over the world, those that live in hot climates or humid climates, and even some moms whose babies just to be, tend to be like mini heaters, you know, that added breathability even more than our already breathable nursing covers was something that they were really looking for. And when you think breathability, I mean, the first fabric that comes to mind is muslin. So it really was a natural fit to make the muslin nursing covers. So we combined the softness and breathability of muslin with the functionality that our nursing covers have been known for, you know, those rigid necklines. So it's super breathable. It's perfect for the summer. And they're available in our gorgeous pattern. So we think moms are really going to love it. So, Amanda, where can our listeners go to purchase these items we've been talking about today? So you can go to www.bebeolay.com. Um, all of the muslin products are going to be available starting February 3rd. And um, we're actually going to offer a great promo code for the Boot Group listeners. That's right. Amanda and everyone at Bebe Ole is offering a 20% discount for our listeners. And that is across the entire site. So whatever you guys want to buy from the website, um, just go to the checkout and you're going to enter this promo code. And it's TBG14. Of course, TBG stands for the Boot Group, 14 2000. 2014. So, Amanda, thank you so much for being on our show and for making these products that benefit breastfeeding moms. Thank you. Have a good one. All right. Well, today on The Boo Group, we're discussing breastfeeding and dealing with judgmental people. Our expert, Amber McCann, is an international board certified lactation consultant at the Breastfeeding Center of Pittsburgh. She is also an avid speaker and presenter on the subject of how lactation consultants can connect with mothers through social media. So thanks for joining us, Amber, and welcome back to the show. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Well, so Amber, why do you think breastfeeding is, is such a magnet for commentary, both good and bad? It truly is, isn't it? <laughs> I feel like every week somebody is sending me some article or something they saw on the news or a blog post they read that seems to be blasting breastfeeding or being judgmental of people breastfeeding in a certain way. Any uh, variation of breastfeeding, if breastfeeding doesn't look like their breastfeeding experience, often people seem to want to comment on that or judge that. And we hear so much in our virtual online world and in our day-to-day real-life world comments from people, um, whether they be supportive, hopefully that is the larger percentage of what we're hearing, um, but also those comments that just come and they just kind of sting at us a little bit. I think for many people, breastfeeding is kind of that first thing we do as a parent. It's the first thing we can kind of be really successful at 
or really fail at. And when I use those words success or fail, I really mean in regards to what everybody else thinks about what we're doing. I hope that people can embrace their own experience, whatever it is, whatever it looks like, whether it looks like the same experience that their neighbor down the street had or not, and feel confident in their own journey as a breastfeeding um, family. But I know that we all hear lots of commentary in and out. It feels so heavy, I think, because it's often the first thing that we are hearing about um, these comments from other people that is that either good or bad. Um, as I have grown as a parent, and my children are 12, 10, and 9 at this point, I've realized that the commentary around breastfeeding might not be so unique. Um, I hear the same source of comments from lots of people about the schools we choose, the extracurriculars we choose, and the way we spend our time, and the way we parent, and the way we guide them through different decisions in life. But I think breastfeeding is, for many people, our first experience with hearing that constant barrage of comments. Um, And so for many of us, we have to come face-to-face with that, determine how we're going to react, and uh, kind of come through that journey in spite of all those comments. Absolutely. And, I mean, how do these judgmental statements affect a mother's breastfeeding duration? You know, for some moms... They're just like water off a duck's back and they roll through and they don't let these comments impact the way uh, they are feeding and parenting their children. And for other people, they have an incredible impact. I have had multiple mothers that I have worked with where the comments they're receiving from a spouse or a family member or a friend or even just people they don't even know in public and that weighs on them so heavily and they struggle with those comments so much that they decide to either give up breastfeeding or feel like they have to hide their breastfeeding, whether that means breastfeeding only at home or only under a cover or um, they have to modify their breastfeeding experience to fit what someone else thinks their breastfeeding experience should be. And that's always hard for me as an advocate and as a clinician. Um, But I have to say, my overarching philosophy of the support I give is what works for you and your family is what works. And when I have these moms who are really struggling with the comments they're receiving, I try to empower them with some words, some phrases, some ideas of ways to communicate to those people who are saying those things to them um, and express their own true feelings. Um, But you know what? Sometimes there's moms who just say, this isn't worth it to me. I would hope that as we grow as a society, as breastfeeding becomes more normal, that this would become less and less and less. Um, But I feel like every time I feel like as a culture, we've gotten a handle on this, then we have some situation where someone experiences some great uh, tragedy while breastfeeding. And I just shake my head and say, oh, we're back at the bottom of the hill again. (laughs) Um, And so I'm always a little grieved when it truly deeply impacts someone's breastfeeding experience because I want moms to feel like they can do this thing, that they're empowered to do this thing that their body was made to do. Absolutely. Well, I'd love to open this up to our panelists in the studio. So ladies, um, have you dealt with judgmental comments? And do you find that they typically come from the same person or is there really no rhyme or reason to it? Uh, Rachel? (laughs) Um, Yes, I have definitely experienced my share of breastfeeding uh, harassment or judgmental comments. Um, I have found that there's, let's see, I've been breastfeeding for about eight years and I've really only had one big negative experience. So I think that, you know, that negative experience was really negative, but uh, overall I think it's been a really positive experience and people have been pretty supportive. But in with working with all the families that I've worked with, I've really seen no rhyme or reason to the people who the comments are coming from. I think for most people, you know, this is not counting like Facebook comments and things like that. For most face-to-face interactions, um, it, they're not, uh, they don't have like a really bad negative intention. I think a lot of it just comes from breastfeeding needing to be normalized more and people just not being accustomed to it, aware of it, familiar with the laws and how it works and it just seeming very abnormal to them. Yeah. How about you, Kalina? 
Um, overall, I've been kind of lucky. I haven't experienced too much face-to-face -face negativity. Um, maybe it's just my attitude about it that helps. Yeah. <laughs> I just kind of feed my baby. Um, <laughs> I've had looks, though. I've had a lot of looks, like today, actually. We were in taking care of some stuff and at an office, and he started getting fussy, so I start feeding him, and this older lady just keeps looking at me and looking mm -hmm. at me, kind of puzzled, like, what are you, in <laughs> public, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, but I just kind of brush it off and I, I think more the online sphere is where I've seen more not directed towards me specifically but if I've posted something or you know supportive or pictures or something people kind of it's more of a uh, uh, how would you say it? not directly at me but they kind of, kind of skirt around the issue but they definitely make their opinions known mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know I just haven't really let it bother me but we're still early on the game too I mean eight months not a lot of people are like looking at you like why are you still feeding that child yeah <laughs> so when we get to that point I'm sure we'll be experiencing some different yeah. you know challenges good point how about you Chris I don't know if I'd call it judgment but I've had people that were wondering what am I doing and why am I doing it and particularly as I did extended breastfeed why am I doing it still, still. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. so um and when I would use it, it um, breastfeeding really as a comfort and a contact measure, I mean, we, we would have times where we would have um, really serious type injury type things. And, and I felt like it was completely appropriate and soothing. And, and, soothing. <laughs> yeah. and, and I was so grateful to have it. I mean, we had flus and, you know, I mean, crazy things that you're like, wow, I'm so grateful to have this at whatever mm -hmm. age. Um, and people just didn't seem like they understood. It was yeah. more of a, I don't understand this, you know, or I know that I did things differently, and why can't you just do things the way that I did them? Right. And it's like, well, you know, this is my path. And what Amber was talking about with it being your path, I mean, it really was this solidifying process for me of becoming who I who I wanted to be in as a mom with my child and it and it grows and changes and breastfeeding is that entryway into that absolutely yeah, I, MJ. I I have a comment just uh, on what Rachel was saying too like um I think that it's the uneducation that really kind of sparks this too because people don't realize that like when my mom told me when my son was born um you know you can give him a bottle you know then it got my mind thinking like well what if I'm you know th I'm doing something wrong or you know I'm like what you know she grew up with being a uh, one of nine and I don't know how my grandma if she did breastfeed and, and she's passed away now but I would have loved to have found <laughs> out like what she did you know because maybe that's what my mom grew up with is bottle feeding and then you know I remember with my little brothers she formula fed them in the bottle I don't remember her breastfeeding very much so like it's it's sometimes it's just their upbringing that they just don't get it that they don't get that even even though the, you know it's a it's a fine comment maybe to make plant seeds of yeah. like doubt in the lack exactly of like d it's yeah. somebody who I mean I just had had my baby so you know to already talking about bottle feeding you know and I was having pr troubles with low milk supply I that's that was something that you just don't you just don't talk to somebody about I don't think you know at that point you know or I wasn't asking about bottle feeding so don't bring it up it's just kind of one of those things where if you realize that you know we are breastfeeding for so many awesome reasons that you would actually you would think twice about asking certain questions you know and, and like Amber was saying you know with all sorts of things like you just you what works for your family works for your family and, and you your breastfeeding relationship may look so different so that you know you're judging them because you're thinking it's not the way that I do it but that's the thing is is that every baby is different every family is different like we're all so different if we embrace that oh my god it would be a whole different mm -hmm. world you know Amber do you do you find that a lot of it has to do with um just different different parenting styles from different generations too and just almost like well if you're the first person that you know breastfed because your family your mom didn't breastfeed like it's almost like a personal affront to her because well I raised you fine why do you have to do it differently yeah I'm, I'm thinking ding 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 like <laughs> you got it I think that's a, a huge factor and you know all of us don't have wonderful beautiful relationships with our mothers Mm -hmm. But a lot of us do. And um, 
the reality is when our mothers were, were, you know, parenting us, when they were new mothers themselves, breastfeeding was not the norm. I mean, our breastfeeding initiation rate were in the toilet at that point. And they parented with the knowledge and understanding that they had at that time. You know, sometimes we go, no better, do better. <laughs> but um, I think many of our mothers, and I would say even grandmothers and sometimes fathers, had a different experience. And so there really is a little bit of that personal feeling of, you know, my daughter's not doing things the same way I did. And is that a judgment on the way I did them? And is she angry at me? I didn't breastfeed her. Or is she judging me for not breastfeeding her 30 years ago? Um, You know, I hear that from grandmas a lot. And I also think I have to be compassionate to their experience because, you know, we all want to care deeply for the people we love. And I see so many new moms and grandma is there too. And, the new mom is having some sort of breastfeeding challenge, pain, low milk supply. I mean, you name it. And that grandma wants to care for her daughter. She wants to make the pain go away. She wants to make the experience easier. She doesn't want her daughter to have to struggle through. And so she is cycling through the things that worked for her 30 some years ago. And she's coming up with options and solutions that don't feel supportive to us as the new breastfeeding mom. And I have to remember, she's working within the framework of, you know, grandma's working in the framework of her understanding. I don't think she's always trying to sabotage breastfeeding, although that does happen too. But I think in general, especially when we're talking about the grandmas, um, they just simply had a different experience. And so sometimes a bit of gentle education and guidance and saying, you know, mom, I really appreciate everything you did for me and you cared for me well. And my choices that are different than yours are not a judgment on the way you cared for me, but I'm just choosing to do things differently. And I've seen mom say this to grandma and grandma go, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. What can, what can I do differently? Because I think truly for most people I encounter, that grandma really wants to support her daughter as best she can. Um, and so sometimes just acknowledging that things are being done a little different way and asking that that grandma will support you in the decisions you're making, even if they're different than the ones she made. Gosh, that can go such a long way. I think the same goes for husbands too. Um, and other partners. Sometimes I see dads who, from the outside looking in, I'm like, dad, you need to shut it down because (laughs) you're offering some options that are not helpful or supportive here. And again, I have to step back and go, he's looking at his wife or partner, and he doesn't want her to have to struggle, and he wants the baby to be okay. And so he's trying to offer options that to him make sense (laughs) to us, feel like they're not supportive of the breastfeeding relationship. So sometimes um, as a practitioner, if I can kind of pull the dad aside and um, give him some extra knowledge or give him a specific job or share some piece of information with him that's going to be especially helpful, a lot of times he'll circle back around and what felt like a challenging you know, relationship over breastfeeding turns into a really good one. I think you're right on it though that that some gentle education and some understanding about other people's experiences can go a long way. The flip side of that is I hate for new moms to have to be the one who's understanding and communicating well (laughs) in those situations because, you know, I love, I love newly postpartum moms. They are what drives the work I do, but they're not always the most logical thinkers or the best. (laughs) I also want to take that pressure off of them um, to have to be the one to communicate all that. So a lot of times I ask for moms before that baby is ever born to communicate clearly with her primary support people, what her desires are, what her hopes are, and how those people around her can best support her. Because I truly believe in my heart of hearts that that's what they want to do for that new mom. Absolutely. Well, and, you know, taking that from, you know, moving from this kind of nuclear family, but also judgy friends. I mean, what tips do you have for dealing with friends who may be 
had different experiences um, or just don't understand why moms are choosing to breastfeed and are, you know, maybe judging them for, for going along that path. What tips do you have? You know, it's so interesting because this new motherhood time is so critical, isn't it? You know, we've come through high school, we've come through college, we've built our friend circles around people. I, you know, typically my friends are fairly like me. We tend to like the same things and think about the same sort of things. And then we hit parenthood. (laughs) And the people I thought I had everything in common with, all of a sudden I don't necessarily have everything in common with. And I see a lot of new moms start to develop new friend groups. They start going to postpartum support groups or breastfeeding support groups. They're building new relationships with other people who are new moms. And that's really a beautiful thing. And, I, um, and I'm really supportive of those kind of environments. But I always hear that mom that says, oh, so-and-so, my best friend since I was 12 is making fun of me because I'm still breastfeeding my baby at 12 months or is making fun of me because, you know, her kid did just fine on formula from birth. Gosh, it's a struggle because we hold those relationships so dear, don't we? Um, And yet we'll hear commentary and we'll hear things. You know, people we've known a long time are a whole lot more free to say things in a raw way than people we've just met. And it's challenging because these are relationships we really love. Again, I think communication is so key. I think communicating that um, the choices I'm making are not a judgment on the way you chose to parent in your family. And um, gentle education. Education, you know, if I'm going to educate a friend or if I'm going to say, I appreciate your thoughts on that, but I'm choosing a different way and here's why, if I can do that in a way that's not defensive, if I can do that in a way with a little bit of humor, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, a little bit not taking myself so seriously, I think it goes a long way. But again, I'm always trying to be so careful to not put that pressure on the new mom to have to be the one uh, to do that. But again, those conversations that happen before the baby is born, I think are always a little easier um, than afterwards. And, you know, we work with moms with a whole range of being willing to speak their mind. Um, And I always encourage moms to just take a step back and say, okay, who am I really? What is the way I would like to communicate this right now? And to feel the power and um, the freedom to speak clearly what's on their heart. Absolutely. Yeah, Rachel, you wanted to say something. I just wanted to say that when I look back at who, you know, my life before I had kids and I think of those people who were the most inspiring to me as a parent, it was always people who, you know, if they were parenting in a different way and I would ask about it or somebody else would ask about it, um, they were, they were confident, um, and they would answer questions, but really the proof is sort of in the pudding of their relationship with their kids. And that's sort of the way that I try to live now in terms of judgment from other people is just that I'm confident in in the relationship that I have with my kids and and the people and who my children are. And I think that as other people approach and make comments, I assume that it's from a place of never having been exposed to the parenting choices we're making. And I just allow like our confidence and our happiness to sort of just be a living example of the fruits of those choices. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, building that confidence, how to build that confidence, isn't that the million-dollar question? <laughs> you know, I, 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 I wish that I could just sprinkle some magic dust over every mom I encounter so that she would feel confident and, and, and capable um, in, in those situations. That's what I want for every mom. Well, and I think also from R- Rachel's perspective, too, and mine, I understand as well, like our kids, we have older kids, too, so we're – we're a little bit more confident talking about the younger stuff, especially because we've lived it. Mm-hmm. So, but definitely as a first time mom, when people would and say as a stuff. first time mom, I piggybacked on the confidence and happiness is and joy of those other moms who right. I came into contact with who yeah. were inspiring to me, right. even if they made different parenting choices yeah. than I did. Right. Just to see that the choice they made for their family brought happiness and joy and confidence to them sort of empowered me. Yeah. That's right. And the support, getting that support. Absolutely. All right. Well, when we come back, we will discuss with Amber and our panelists tips for dealing with judgmental comments when breastfeeding in public or breastfeeding longer than maybe someone else expected. So we'll be right back. (music) 
Well, welcome back to the show. We are here with Amber McCann, an international board certified lactation consultant at the Breastfeeding Center of Pittsburgh. And we are talking about breastfeeding and dealing with judgmental people. So Amber, let's talk about some tips for some some particular scenarios. So we'd, we've touched a little bit about this, but what tips do you have for when a spouse or a partner is being judgmental or unsupportive about our breastfeeding decisions? Communicate, communicate, communicate. <laughs> um, we, I help out with a lovely new mom coffee here in Pittsburgh run by Kathy McGrath, who is just one of those people I get in her presence. And I think I just want to stay here for a while because she <laughs> makes me feel really good. Um, but she is a lovely childbirth educator um, and supporter of moms in our community. And she always just says, communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, it's it's challenging because you want to be on the same page with your spouse. And, you know, gosh, I wasn't on the same page with my spouse this morning in regards to something uh, with our children. Uh, you know, breastfeeding isn't going to be the only uh, the only parenting issue that might come under fire in this sometimes. But I think the answer is always the same. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Again, I sound like a broken record, but I think having that conversation with your spouse or partner before the baby is born, what your needs, are, what you, what are you going to need from that person? What are you going to hope from them? Maybe what you want to say is, honey, I need you to not offer a pacifier. I just, that is really important to me, and I need to make sure that's on the table before this baby ever gets here. Or whatever it is that is important to you. I think saying that ahead of time is really good. I am a huge fan of dads going to a prenatal breastfeeding class with the mom. I would say in the classes I teach, Robin, I don't know what your experience is, but I probably get a spouse or a partner with half of the moms that come to take a class. And I think I'm doing pretty well at that rate. I would love to see 100% of the moms that come to take my class bring a spouse or partner with them. Because I have seen dads, literally their face changes from that, <laughs> oh my gosh, this this woman I am married to dragged me to this embarrassing class, I'm going to see if I can bear boobs, <laughs> to like they're leaving out the door as a breastfeeding cheerleader. Yeah. Um, I try to always give dads some specific tips or pieces of information at my classes that are theirs to own, the things that they can do to help Um, moms be supportive. I always say to dad, look, here is my number. When she is crying in the middle of the night because she doesn't know what to do, but she doesn't want to bother anyone and reach out for help, here's my number. You call. Um, I try to really make dads know that they are a part of this breastfeeding relationship. Breastfeeding is not just about the mom and the baby. There are more factors, and he is a critical one, and he plays a critical role in being supportive of mom. And, you know, the evidence on this is so overwhelming that the Surgeon General even included dads and grandmas um, in her points about ways that we can really support breastfeeding in this country. So um, dads who are supportive of breastfeeding are critical to mom's success. And so I think communicate, 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 and for dads to really reach out and get educated about breastfeeding for themselves are really key points uh, that we can happen. Awesome. Um, it, I actually, I would say, I, I think the rate I have might be a little bit higher. I think I'd say 80% awesome. of the the, peop- the women that Fantastic. come to, yeah, and um, there's nothing, there's no better compliment than when a partner walks out of there saying that they enjoyed the class and that they wish they could breastfeed. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, believe me, oh, we wish you could too. (laughs) Um, Well, so Amber, what tips do you have for a mama dealing with negative comments when she's breastfeeding in public? Oh, you know, I always love this question. The the thing about the negative comments when we're breastfeeding in public is often they come from complete strangers. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, I, I appreciated your panelists giving their experiences. You know, I breastfed three children, and I had zero experiences of negative uh, interactions while I was breastfeeding in public. I think, you know, we hear about them in the news, and they feel really scary, um, and When it happens, it's a big deal, and we need to take it seriously. But I don't ever want to scare moms away from doing it. 
I don't want them to feel like the moment they lift their shirt to see their baby in Target, all the like flashing lights are going to come on and <laughs> you know, like the police sirens are going to happen. I think breastfeeding in public happens a whole lot more than a lot of people realize. Um, and I think on most days, a lot of people do it and have no negative interactions at all. So I, I want people to feel feel confident. But the reality is, it does happen. Um, you know, there's always some story in the news about somebody being asked to leave a restaurant or a store because they're breastfeeding. And I, I think it's important for moms to know their rights and to know how they're protected um, under the law. I love for moms to go to this great website called Breastfeeding Law, Know Your Legal Rights. It's www.breastfeedinglaw.com. And on that website, it lists all the laws related to breastfeeding, both federal laws and state laws. I love moms to go check out what their laws are so that they're clear. In most places, you are legally allowed to breastfeed in public anywhere that you are legally entitled to be. So um, by knowing the law ahead of time gives that mom a little power um, to know that, that she's, she's not coming up against a legal issue um, there. Um, I also like that for moms to know that they're not alone, that if they experience a negative um, interaction while they're out in public, that there are resources and people that will help to advocate for them. Best for Babes has a nursing and public hotline where if you've had some negative experience breastfeeding in public, you can call the number and the volunteers who work that line can help find appropriate advocacy um, for you and your community. And that number is 855-NIPFREE, N-I-P as in nurse in public, and then F-R-E-E. Free. And you can find that phone number on Best for Babes website as well. Um, you know, again, to come back to what I said before, it's hard because it's often complete strangers who give comments uh, in those situations. And depending on who you are, there's more power in a stranger's comments or there's less power in a stranger's comments. I encourage people to just say, thank you. I appreciate your concern. I'm going to keep getting my baby. Of course, in some situations it works and that it doesn't. But I want people to know that you are allowed to breastfeed in public. And I like for people to breastfeed in public because I think it normalizes breastfeeding um, in our country. I also recognize that if you're out having a lovely dinner with your family and a waiter or waitress comes up to you and asks you to stop feeding your baby, that can really rattle you. So own those feelings. Um, stand up for yourself. Even if you can't stand up for yourself in that moment, reach out for support and advocacy through the Best for Babes line or other breastfeeding um, communities around you. Cool. Ladies and in the panel, I'd love to ask you guys as well, what tips do you have would you add to this um, to for help moms who are dealing with a negative comment when they're breastfeeding in public? Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would say the most sort of powerful, empowering and powerful thing you can do in that moment is to take a deep breath and just simply recite the law in the state where you live. So just, I mean, it's usually just one sentence like, oh, I, you, I'm sorry, you just must not be aware. Actually, in California, I do have the, light, the legally protected right to breastfeed um, anywhere my baby and I are allowed to be without condition. You know, just simply <laughs> approach it from the standpoint that they're just unaware of the law. That's a good tip. How about you, Chris? Anything you want to add? Um, I just wanted to, to add that I think it's also about um, the confidence that we kind of create and exude. And if people are taking that and they're seeing our power and they're actually against that, that's the judgment part, it's, it's really not us. It's really them. And to even do some out loud, under your breath, acknowledging of this is theirs, it, yeah. it, it's very releasing yeah. because it's not yours. And then, you know, take the appropriate next step to Ready to own to your it, yeah. rights and to 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 retain your power because it, it you already have it. Yeah, that's a really you good point. How about you, Colleen? Anything you'd want to add to this? Um, I think really the just just being aware of your rights is really empowering because before we started on our journey, I really wasn't. But, I, you know, I hadn't had a child yet, so there wasn't a lot of reason to be. But um, I 
once I went to, I think it was at a, a La Leche League meeting after I had my son, and they actually mm. handed us the little business cards mm. with the law written on it. And sometimes, you know, in a, in a situation like that, I mean, I've, I've been in them, not where necessarily I was being reprimanded for breastfeeding, more so they were being proactive telling me, oh, but you can't breastfeed here. So just so you know. And in a situation like that, I was really caught off guard because I had never had anyone tell me up front before it even had happened, don't breastfeed here. And so in a situation where you're just at a loss for words, I think it's easier just to pull out a card and hand it to someone and say, (laughs) just read that, please. (laughs) Because, you know, you don't, you're you're just, I don't know. It was just really shocking for me. And so... um, I think even having maybe something written down like that, where if you don't feel confident enough to say it, if you're really caught off guard, you can just hand something to someone and it has, you know, all of your rights right there for them. That's a great tip. You know, you were mentioning today, too, that you had this older woman kind of looking at you while you were nursing in public. And I remember when I used to nurse my boys in public that that I actually just kept staring at them because I didn't want to make eye contact with anybody else. And so who knows if people were making, like, (laughs) faces at me or anything. I really just kind of ignored everybody else in the space and just looked down at them and paid attention to them and or looked at, you know, my friend, if my friend was with me or whatever. And um, and that was really helpful for me because I I get really jarred when uh, when I feel like someone's looking at me in a disparaging way. So that's um, one of our um, virtual panelists said that don't make eye contact (laughs) another one said just ignore them Um, they don't matter and have should have no bearing on what you do with your baby take a deep breath and let it go and and yeah I mean I did the same thing too Robin just I was just looking at my son the whole time you know and and just focusing on him and so and but sometimes it is hard to not you know just look around and and thinking you're you might be being judged and I totally get what you're saying Kalina because I would be shocked I would be you know fight or flight what Mm -hmm. I do I need to say something you know so, but handing a card and just being, yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's <laughs> perfect. It's a easier. It you know? um, Amber, what what tips do you have for someone making a comment that the baby or the child is is too old to breastfeed? Like, I can't believe you're still breastfeeding your child. Um, any tips for that? You know, uh, I I think that is one of the most oft quoted, uh, you know, judgmental comments that moms report that they hear. Um, you know, baby is two months old and someone's like, oh my gosh, you're still, you're still breastfeeding your baby? <laughs> and you're thinking, this is still an infant. Um, you know, I, yeah, I encourage moms to know the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation and that that is that you would breastfeed your baby for one year and as, and then as long as it's mutually beneficial. So even the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine says, gosh, hit one year and keep going. Um, you know, in other health organizations around the world, they talk about two years and beyond. Um, the worldwide average is significantly beyond that. So um, we in the United States have some funky ideas about how long to breastfeed a baby. Again, I'm a big fan of what works for you and your family is what works. And uh, it's it's the personal choice of a family to decide how long they're going to breastfeed their baby. Now, you know, some families come up with, after babies get to a certain age, the agreement with the child that we'll only nurse at home or we'll only nurse in the evening or, um, you know, they come to a point of deciding on that. And and I'm really supportive of that. The flip side is I don't want breastfeeding to have to be in the closet anymore. And I feel like for so many people, breastfeeding beyond a year is something they have to be really hush-hush um, and quiet about. So often those moms are going to hear, this baby's too old. Once they can ask for it or lift up your shirt, it has gone on too long. I like to empower families with the facts about breastfeeding. We know that the immunology benefits of a baby um, breastfeeding beyond a year continue in a really powerful way that um, we keep our babies healthy by continuing to breastfeed them as long as we're going to breastfeed them. Um, you know, so sometimes I have moms say, you know, someone makes a comment. They're like, ah, well, we're going to at least continue through cold and flu season. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and and that can, can uh, be helpful to people. Uh, again, it's, uh, you know, exuding that confidence and saying, this is what works for my family. Um, and, and that's not a comment on the fact that 
you didn't breastfeed as long. This is just what we're choosing to do for us. Yeah. Chris, did you find you had you had mentioned that this these were kind of the judgmental comments that maybe you dealt with? Um, how how did you handle it? Um, I took kind of an interesting, maybe it's not that unique, but I actually just, it was family members, first of all. So I would talk with them openly. Um, I felt like if they were actually exposing their judgments to me, then that was actually an open door that I could walk through. Nice. (laughs) Versus, um, you know how I think you were describing just the looks and the nonverbal, that's kind of a door you can't walk through because there's no opening you would actually have to make the first step right so I walked through the door and I and and we did get a lot of the well I didn't do this and and a lot of my saying well that's okay you know I don't have a problem with what you did are you still having a problem with what I do and it was much it, it freed them and it freed me and it freed us to have a conversation together so um I have, uh, I've had the pleasure of having people like my mom who have come around and said, you know, I really didn't think that what you were choosing would work because it looks so different, but I see that it's working for you. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that you are just doing your thing. That's awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's a nice way to have it come back around, which you don't always get. Yeah, absolutely. Rachel, how about you? Have you dealt with um, comments about how um, how long you end up breastfeeding your children? Um, you know, I haven't really from any, um, like, people who are close in my life because I think my first I breastfed for a year, my second I breastfed for almost four years, and my third is still nursing. So I think <laughs> with the first child I was sort of able to – prune my <laughs> my friendship garden well um, so that by the time you know I had my subsequent children all of the people in my circle were very very supportive and like you talked about by that point I was a lot more confident so anytime people do comment about it now I don't really receive it as judgment I receive it as like and like you talked about like curiosity like an open door I, I hear them saying I've never seen that before what is that you know, and then I can just sort of say, you know, what address their specific question with a smile and just assume that I planted a seed for them that can sort of leave the door open for the future. Cool. And how about you, Kalina? What are you thinking about? <laughs> um, well, obviously, we haven't had really too many issues with uh, the age issue. Um, but I have already had people say, you know, oh, so are you going to go a year? Yeah, a year? That's yeah. about when they right? the, the cutoff, right? <laughs> yeah. They're like, like oh, when sudden, are you going to stop? And yeah. I'm thinking, well, we haven't even thought about that point yeah. yet. And even going into it originally, I mean, my fiance was like, he, and he went to a breastfeeding class with me and he was all, he was really supportive about it, but he was also kind of weirded out, I guess, about extended breastfeeding and past a year, you know, thinking of two year olds nursing, but my mom did it. So, awesome. <laughs> you know, she didn't do it with all of us. She breastfed all of us, but you know, some of us longer than others. Um, and so I kind of, I already have that little bit of a support and just the amazing women I think that I've met that do it and do it so confidently really inspires me. So, uh, you know, when we get there, I just think all the knowledge that I have and security in why it's a good choice is going to be helpful. But, I mean, even my brothers, I mean, I have three brothers, and all three of them, the first time saw me breastfeeding, were like, ew, (laughs) put that away, what are you doing, oh my gosh, you're my sister, ew, I don't want to see that. (laughs) And at first I was like, okay, fine, I'll go in the other room then if you don't want, like, whatever. And now they've all gotten used to it, which is amazing, and he's only eight months. Exactly, and so I'm thinking, well, I must be doing a great service to their future wives, because (laughs) you are. they won't even have an issue. I even, my one brother, he's he gets excited about it now when I tell him inf- new information. I'm like, oh, did you know this about breast milk or did you? And he thinks it's great. And he's he actually went to school to be a phlebotomist mm-hmm. and stuff. Cause so he, ca- he has an interest in that type of thing. Yeah. So I think just spreading, you know, the knowledge slowly and, and you know, bit by bit is helping. Um, but I do know that when he gets a little older, that's another thing that we'll have to address with them because it, I even I posted a, uh, a picture of, of a mom breastfeeding a toddler. I shared it on Facebook. And the oldest of my three younger brothers goes, that kid looks old as 
another word that I wouldn't <laughs> say. And I said, well, yeah, he, he's probably a toddler, and it's more common than you think. And I just yeah. left it at that, and he didn't comment back. So, <laughs> you know, he awesome. didn't really have a lot much else to say. <laughs> Chris, you well, were going to mention something, Well, yeah, too. I wanted to share, because you, what you were talking about with your brothers, I realized, too, that as I was doing what I was doing within my family, that it really spread. And my husband has become the biggest breastfeeding advocate ever. Mm -hmm. He'll talk to anyone and everyone about breastfeeding. And I also wanted to share, because you talked about planting the seed. My son um, breastfed until he was seven. And that sounds, it sounds even crazy long to me. (laughs) But, But I trusted what we were doing. And believe it or not, I actually received reasoning on why that was important when I did some testing a a year or so ago. And both of us have metabolic issues, my husband and myself, which we passed on to my son, actually doubly. And I really feel extremely strongly that everything that he was getting, all that immune thing, is what exactly he He needed. needed. Yeah. And I was just so, I was so blessed to kind of get that information I think at the time where I was really like it's like validating (laughs) yes and I was questioning why 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 is this but I was trusting it it was but it was it was so hard to do those things when you don't have the evidence and then to get it was just a bonus that's awesome. just a huge bonus I think I think too that people don't realize that the nursing relationship actually does change over time with the I'm really enjoying (laughs) now being able to tell my toddler okay one second and then we'll nurse I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna and he understands that and we haven't night weaned I would love to but I and we're getting to that point where you know I I say hold on one second when the sun comes up you know we'll we'll nurse and so it's not like we're popping out our boob every five seconds you know <laughs> it's it's totally different like um of course when he is upset or something happens and he hurts himself I have no problem with nursing him because I mean he's he's fine like that right away you know but it, it's a little give and take between both of us and it's really been cool because I I didn't know what it was going to be like you know and now I just over time have kind of adopted from other moms that are older than me or have older kids and and um and it's it's been nice it is totally a relationship and it's changed you know now that that he's a little older and to trust in that change as it progresses Mm -hmm. and and to experience it there's there's nothing like that to to really build into your future absolutely well amber just a final word maybe i mean a lot i think the the conversation went from almost judgment to the way that we're overcoming judgment is by finding the other women in our lives who inspire us to keep us going and doing what we do. So um, any any final thoughts on that? I was just thinking, even at my stage of parenthood, that's still the truth. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that is still so core to the way I parent, even though we're way beyond breastfeeding, even though the challenges now are um, preteen anxiety and emotions. (laughs) So it's still about surrounding ourselves with those people that really build us up and not tear us down and um, and how to build those support systems. You know, it's one of my mantras in my support of breastfeeding women is we were not designed to do this alone. We, you know, you think back to history. This is really the first generations where we haven't mothered within a larger community. And so often we're isolated and we're, uh, and we're alone and, And the people are missing those sorts of relationships in their life. And I think they are critical. That's why I love, you know, new mom's coffees and breastfeeding support groups and places where people can go find the like-minded friends, really reach out, build deep relationships that continue to build them up, um, you know, over time. So I know this went from like practical tips on what to say to the person who's kind of in your face about breastfeeding (laughs) to this, you know, deep kind of relational thing. But I think it's really at the core of confident motherhood is having people around you that can support you. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much, Amber, and to our wonderful panelists for sharing these amazing tips on how to deal with negative breastfeeding comments from judgmental people. And uh, for our 
our Boob Group Club members, our conversation will continue after the end of the show as Amber will offer her favorite tips for dealing with judgmental comments from complete strangers. For more information about our Boob Group Club, please visit our website at theboobgroup.com. So here's a question from one of our listeners. This is from Tracy, and she said, um, I have a periareolar incision breast augmentation surgery 13 years ago, and since then I've had two children. I didn't have a lot of letdown with either child and stopped breastfeeding between six weeks and two months with both. I'm pregnant again and would like to be more successful this time around. Are there any tips or tricks you would recommend to me? I do get some letdown, but not like I had before I had had the surgery. I didn't much care when I had the surgery, and didn't think I was going to have any more kids back then, but now obviously I do. Thanks a lot for any help you can give. Hi, Boob Group listeners. My name is Veronica Tingzon. I'm a board-certified lactation consultant and owner of the Original Comfort Food Lactation Services. And Tracy, really the, the question is, what did your breasts look like prior to the surgery? Honestly, sometimes we don't know if it's the chicken or the egg that came first. Was it the actual uh, quantity of the mammary tissue that's affecting your low letdown or possible low milk production? Was it um, the fact that you had one breast larger than the other or maybe triangular shaped? Um, Was it um, that your hormonal levels really were never in sync? Or is it the actual incision that cut some nerve endings that makes it so that you don't feel um, the baby suckle so well and therefore you're having a, a very slow let down reflex. Um, so unfortunately, you know, without knowing what your previous history was, I can't really tell you exactly what it is that's going on. However, there's a couple of avenues that you can take. Um, one, you can already start doing slight nipple stimulation techniques with your fingers, preferably in the, like the last month of your pregnancy. Um, in Australia, it's very, very common for women to do some hand expression techniques. And if they get any colostrum, to start saving that colostrum just in case um, you'll need your own milk uh, to supplement the baby with when, once the baby is here. So you can do some of that nipple stimulation and hand expression uh, prior to your delivery. The other thing is that um, what I typically do with a mom who has had breast implants is that once the baby is here, even if the baby is full-time breastfeeding, I'll get them on a pump from the first moment. So you can always request that you get a pump in your room from the time you deliver. So you would breastfeed the baby and afterwards pump for maybe a good 10, 15 minutes afterwards. Yes, this is exhausting. And in the first one to three weeks of life, you might want to look into doing breastfeed pump, breastfeed pump, breastfeed pump. That way you are ensuring that you are building a good milk supply and that um, your, your milk letdown will then kind of follow suit. Uh, the more that you have, the better letdown you should experience. Um, sometimes it's not even the breasts themselves that don't build the milk supply. Sometimes it's the baby's poor suckle. So maybe this will kind of help. Um, the third thing that I'm going to suggest is, you know, start off and running with supplementing at the breast. If the baby is getting more food at the breast and a little bit more liquidy food, then the baby's going to do better suckling. If the baby does better suckling, you're going to get a better stimulation. Once again, the more supply that you have, the better the letdown will be. Um, and lastly, you can always uh, try using some herbal lactagogues like um, uh, fenugreek or blessed thistle or uh, even something called goat's root, which is kind of hard to get your hands on, but um, if it is a hormonal uh, reason why you're not getting a good letdown, then perhaps that can help put your balance or your hormones into balance so that you can get a better development of the milk supply. Um, There's uh, some great products out there that have a cocktail of those herbs already concocted 
so that you can get the maximum effect from the herbs. And there's also the medicinal lactagogues like Dompuridone or Reglan that could perhaps also help you. So Tracy, I hope that this uh, this helps and, and these answers um, are, are good enough for you. If you've tried all of those things, then the other thing that you can do is you can maybe get with a lactation consultant and I really suggest this anyway, get with a lactation consultant that you can have follow you even after you're discharged from the hospital and maybe if she does know your entire um, health history, maybe she can start putting those pieces together for you. This wraps up our show for today. We appreciate you listening to The Boob Group. Don't forget to check out our sister show, Preggy Pals, for expecting parents, our show, Parent Savers, for moms and dads with newborns, infants, and toddlers, and Twin Talks, our show for parents of twins. Thanks for listening to The Boob Group, your judgment-free breastfeeding resource. This has been a new mommy media production. The information and material contained in this episode are presented for educational purposes only. Statements and opinions expressed in this episode are not necessarily those of New Mommy Media and should not be considered facts. While such information and materials are believed to be accurate, it is not intended to replace or substitute for professional medical advice or care and should not be used for diagnosing or treating health care problem or disease or prescribing any medication. If you have questions or concerns regarding your physical or mental health or the health of your baby, Please seek assistance from a qualified health care provider. Hey, mamas. Don't forget to check out Mighty Moms. It's our online community built for new moms just like you. Not only can you connect with other moms, but you can also join us backstage for special mom-only online events. And you'll also be notified when we're recording so you can join us as a special guest. Visit our website, newmommymedia.com, and click on the Mighty Moms banner. It's free. That's newmommymedia.com. See you there.